Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. So great to have you with me once again as we take a look at four more chapters in the Word of God. We have before us today in our readings, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, James chapter 4, Jonah chapter 1, and Luke chapter 6. So some really great, famous, important, very uh, convicting passages before us today in our reading. So 1 Chronicles chapter 17 here, the Lord's uh, covenant with David, the Davidic covenant here, Chronicles version of it. And um, David says that, you know, he wants to build the Lord a temple because he's been living in a tent. And Nathan says, do whatever you have in mind. God is, uh, is with you. Um, but that night, God says to Nathan, tell David, no, He's not going to build me uh, a house. He's not going to build me a temple. Uh, my home has always been a tent. And he says, I've never asked for a temple. So go and say that, you know, I've been with you, David. Instead of, you know, telling, you know, David doing what he's going to do for me, tell him I'm going to do something for him. He says, I, I will build a house for you, David, a dynasty. And he says, when you die and join your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and I will make his kingdom strong. He's the one who will build a house, a temple for me, and I will secure his throne forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. I will never take my favor from him as I took it from the one who ruled before you. I will confirm him as a king over my house and my kingdom for all time, and his throne will be secure forever. Now, if you compare Second Samuel chapter 7 with First Chronicles 17, which both have this promise from the Lord, this Davidic covenant from the Lord about um, the God building David a house. There's some subtle differences, but they're significant. Uh, for example, in Samuel, it talks about how when he sins, that God would discipline him. Well, here we don't have that language. And remember that Samuel's likely written much earlier than Chronicles. And so in Samuel's writing, the thinking is still along the lines of the physical kings descended from David like Solomon. And so when Solomon would sin, right, that was the covenant promise that God would discipline or the descendants of David. But when you get to Jesus, the son of David par excellence, uh, you're talking about a sinless one. And so this Chronicles version of the Davidic covenant really sounds like God is talking about this descendant of David, the Lord Jesus. And once we get into the New Testament, you see the promises made there and the language about him being sitting on the throne of his father David forever. And when you put in all the prophets about how David will come and I will send them David, right? So this is the language that we have here of future prophecy, not regarding a, the physical sons, the, the dynasty of David, like Solomon and his sons, but ultimately the Lord Jesus. And so God's doing a spiritual thing here in building the house, the kingdom uh, of Jesus. Um, all right, so David hears this, and he's super happy, and so he praises the Lord, and really, really significant here in uh, in this prayer here, where he says uh, basically that everything that God, everything that he has, has, has come from the Lord here. He says, there's no one like you. He says, we've never even heard of another God like you. What other nation on earth? is like your people Israel. What other nation have you redeemed from slavery, right? Like, God, you have done so much and been so good to us. He says, all right, Lord, I'm your servant. Do as you have promised concerning me and my family. May it be a promise that will last forever. May your name be established and honored forever. So everyone will say, the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel is Israel's God, and may the house of your servant David continue before you forever. He says, um, you know, this prayer here in response to this Davidic covenant. What a beautiful uh, passage we have here. And then we go to James chapter 4, and here we have, as we'll have with Luke chapter 6, uh, just a, kind of a hodgepodge, a number of things that these chapters are talking about. First of all, the nature of quarrels. Here it says at the beginning of chapter 4, you know, you have quarrels and fights among you. He says, where does that really come from? In the heart, where is that really coming from? And he says it's coming from evil desires at war within you. He says you don't, you want what you don't have. He says you're jealous of others and you can't get it. So you fight and you quarrel. It's selfishness. He says even when you ask, you get, don't get it because your motives are wrong. So he says this famous verse, don't you realize friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And so he says, so humble yourselves. 
before God, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you, right? Humble yourself, wash your hands, purify your hearts, grieve over your sin, humble yourselves again before the Lord, verse 10, and he will lift you up. It says, don't speak evil against each other. Don't criticize or judge each other. It says, God alone who gave the law, he is judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. And, and then he says, and look, you know, you're so boastful and proud, you think like you're in charge. Today or tomorrow, we'll go to a certain town and stay there a year. We'll do business. We'll make a profit. He says, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? How do you know, you know that you'll even be here tomorrow? This is the way the scriptures d- describe our lives, and it's, um, it's sobering, but necessary, I think, for us to consider that our lives, as he says, verse 14, are like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. And so we are always to say, and obviously we don't have to verbally say this all the time, but believe this in our heart all the time. If the Lord wants us to, if the Lord wills something, we will live and do this or that. No boasting about your pretentious plans. That's evil. And he says, remember, it's sin to know what you ought to do and not to do. you got to be a doer of the word. Going back to the beginning of chapter 1 there. All right, then we come to the first chapter of the prophet Jonah. Famous story, great story. And most of the action that we're familiar with uh, comes from chapter 1, right? This is where God comes to Jonah, says, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, basically, no, I'm turns with, goes the other way to Joppa, boards a ship headed for Tarshish. And what's really incredible, what always strikes me about this chapter, is how Jonah is able to, in the midst of this, d- denying what the Lord wants, going the opposite way, fleeing from the will of God here, gets in a boat and is able to fall asleep. Like he has peace in his heart through this. Right? He goes into the boat and he sleeps. So there's this storm and everyone's like all worried about the storm and he's sleeping through it. I says, all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain goes down after him. He said, how can you sleep? Get up. Pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. And then the crew says, cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods. Of course, it's Jonah. He says, it's me. I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord. I worship the God of heaven the, who made the sea and the land, right? The real God, not all your fake gods. And so Jonah says, just trust me, throw me into the sea and it will become calm. It's, it's my fault. Now, the sailors don't want to do this. They try hard, get, you know, pick another option. Nothing works. So, so the sailors have to pick Jonah up. They throw him into the raging sea and the storm stops. And incredibly, at the end of the chapter, you read here two things. One, the sailors were awestruck and they offered God, the Lord, a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. So they come to faith, basically, in the God of Israel. And meanwhile, verse 17, the Lord had arranged, had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah because God knew all of this was coming and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. All right, then we last come to Luke chapter six and a number of things again going on here, a number of things, you know, for application, for consideration, uh, teaching on the Sabbath, right? Jesus, he says that he's Lord of the Sabbath. Right, he, he, because here he is, his disciples are eating on the Sabbath, and then Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. You know, Jesus says, do, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil, to save life or destroy it? Because that's what, all that's going on here with his healing, with the disciples eating lawfully. And so it says, uh, he looked around at them one by one, and apparently nobody answered, nobody willing to answer. So he says to the man, hold out your hand, and he heals him, and it's restored and the enemies of Jesus are wild with rage, begin to discuss what to do with him. Then you read of Jesus choosing the 12. We talked about it before, uh, with him calling some of them to himself, like Simon Peter and Andrew, James, John, Levi, or Matthew. Here's the whole list of his 12. Talks here about the crowds following Jesus. Then we have Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, where we have the Beatitudes, right? God blesses you who are poor. The difference here between Luke and Matthew is Matthew's sound more spiritual, you might say, and Luke's uh, version sounds more material or physical, right? So it's not poor in spirit here. It's God bless you who are poor. It's not hungers and thirst for righteousness. It's who hungered now, uh, who weep now. And then, you know, because look at the woes. There's also woes here, not just beatitudes, not just blessings, but who, uh, what sorrow awaits you. Woe to you, rich. Woe to you, fat, prosperous. Woe to you who laugh. 
right? Again, this idea of boasting in what you have, similar to what James talked about. And he goes on similar to the Sermon on the Mount, right? Love for enemies, not judging others. Um, and then, you know, the ending to the Sermon on the Mount in both cases here, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say, right? The one who uh, builds his house on me, right? Who actually does what I say, who listens, that's the one who's going to stand. But anyone who hears what I'm saying and doesn't obey it, it's like a person who builds a house with no foundation and it collapses. All right, that's all we have time for today. Again, we had First Chronicles 17, James chapter 4, Jonah chapter 1, and Luke chapter 6. Thanks for being with me these last few minutes. Hope you have a wonderful day and uh, enjoy your time in the Lord's Word. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. We'll see you again soon.